Well, welcome to the post-lunch session. And uh, this is, uh, I was just saying to these guys, um, it's a really, to me, it's a, a, a really important session because as uh, indie game makers, we often speak a lot to ourselves, right? We think of uh, indie games and the sort of the effort to make them and the labor of love that they are um, as something that's sort of unique um, in our community. And within our community, of course, it is. Um, but it isn't unique to media and art and, and other modes of expression. And so we wanted to uh, invite some folks to talk about uh, indie, medium, indie media across the spectrum. Uh, and uh, this panel is uh, uh, going to be hosted and is sponsored by our partners ITVS, so we're really thankful for that. And I want to thank Matthew Macheri for coming and putting this great panel uh, of folks together. And I'm going to just let him actually take it from here. Um, but thanks again, guys. Great. Thanks, Tracy. Really appreciate that. So um, my name is Matthew Macheri. I'm the Director of Digital Initiatives at Independent Television Service. And uh, has anyone here heard of ITVS, Independent Television Service? Okay, a couple people. Tracy, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so we actually, we produce a show called Independent Lens on PBS, and we are basically the intermediary between the independent film community, mostly documentary filmmakers, and the public television system. And uh, so we produce Independent Lens, which is on PBS, and, but uh, a lot of our documentaries go to some of the other programs uh, that you may know, so POV, Frontline, and some of the, the other PBS series. So uh, my role there is to oversee digital media, which uh, we do, uh, we, we produce some interesting digital media content, including games. This year we're actually producing three games, which is a great, uh, it's great for me, because then I get to come to Indicade, which I've been telling some of the panelists is my, is hands down my favorite event of the year. It's the one, one thing I look forward to. <laughs> um, so I go to a lot of film festivals. Um, and I actually come from, from the music world, and so having spent time in some of these conferences and spaces where independent media makers get together, this is actually the first time I've actually seen this conversation happen. Um, I've, at all the independent you know, film festivals and conferences I've been to, I've never seen uh, an opportunity to get people from various, various independents from, from different arenas, different stripes of work, together talking about what it means to be independent. And so I want to thank Tracy and Stephanie and the other folks at Indicade for kind of having the vision to, uh, to, to bring us together and to invite ITVS to, to host this panel. And I think it's, it's prescient because the, the timing is right for this. And we talked a little bit this, about this before, um, that you know, we're, at, we're at a moment where for independent artists um, across the spectrum, they are dealing with the same platforms, the same strategies, um, despite the medium. So, I mean, everyone is, you know, working with iTunes, is doing crowdfunding, is working with direct-to-fan social media campaigns. These are all things that every independent artist is, is dealing with right now. So, I think there's that. Um, and then there's also this timing where there's opportunities for more collaboration. As you know, there's, there's opportunities for transmedia and cross-platform work. And so a lot of those examples are kind of big Hollywood properties. And so why not independents kind of getting together and thinking about collaborating on, on big multimedia or transmedia projects? So uh, it was great to actually think about putting this panel together. I feel like it's sort of like the beginning of a heist movie where you're like, <laughs> you're like, we need the game designer. We need the musician. We need the demolitions expert. We don't have a demolitions expert. At least one of you was holding out on me. <laughs> Um, but, so, but we do have a really incredible panel. I'm really excited about the group that we, we brought out. Um, and I'm going to introduce them in a second. I've got my little cheat sheet here. But I, I do um, want to say, like, what, the, what are the goals here today? So I think the first goal is, at the end of this, to hopefully create um, an independent media Voltron-like robot that's going to overthrow the corporate overlords. So that's goal one. Goal two is to, uh, you know, for those of you in the, the game space, to get kind of a peek into the worlds of uh, other independent artists and for us to have an interesting conversation about independent media in general and have a big group hug after that. And then we overthrow the corporate overlords. So just so you know, that's, we're going to get there eventually. Um, so without further ado, what I'm going to do is I want to kind of go down the list here and introduce um, the awesome panelists. 
And I'm going to show a little bit of their work because uh, for those of you, um, I think it would be helpful to have some context about the work that they are doing in their specific field. And then we're going to jump into some questions, and then we definitely want to open it up to, to the audience. And feel free, like during our conversation, if you want to jump in with a question, um, raise your hand and, uh, and, we'll, um, and we'll do that because I think we really want this to be a, an open dialogue. Um, so I will start with, uh, here we go. I'm going to start on my left here. This is Alessandro Cortini. And Alessandro uh, is mainly known for being in Nine Inch Nails, but he's respected um, but he's respected for his own music under the names Mod Wheel Mood and Sono Io. Did I get that right? Um, is that Italian? He, okay, good. I want to make sure I get the pronunciation. Right. He's independent and releases his own records using Top Spin. He sells quite a bit, but part of what is, um, but what's interesting about what uh, he does is sort of how he releases his albums. And um, if you go to the Sono Io website, you can get familiar with his work. And you can see he does these really interesting bundles of his work, including this one, which is the Su Onio, how do I pronounce that? Suono Io. Suono Io. It's all Italian. Which <laughs> is a, a digital album plus a portable synthesizer, handmade synthesizer that uh, Alessandro makes. Um, so, you know, do you want to turn on your mic? Because you're going to do a better yep. job of explaining this. So, um, maybe you could talk a little bit about, your, about the bundles that you've been producing. Well, the idea was that um, the medium being digital has to be free. So no matter what, if somebody wants to get my music, we'll find a way to get it without paying. So uh, <laughs> it's not a good model, you know, in order to make a living of music. So the idea was to provide a series of bundles from zero dollars up to, in my case, I think it was $300 or $200 maximum, and um, provide those with free downloads for the music. And um, so we started from, you know, the free music, the free record, uh, which obviously led to to a lot more exposure than it would have been if it would have been just for sale. And then T-shirts, CDs, uh, with an emphasis on uh, limited, signed, numbered, touched by the artist, or, you know, there's a certain amount of handmade factor to it that I think helped. Uh, handmade and limited that really helped for the stuff to, you know, to sell. And culminating with the synthesizer, which was a handmade instrument, tangible, proof that you know you could link hardware and the music side because it was based on sounds from the record. Very cool. So we want to talk a little bit more about those business strategies, but I did want to show you a little bit of Alessandro's music. I have the uh, be beard there. Long <laughs> beard. So where where is this where is this This what is was this uh, recorded 2 years ago I believe at the San Francisco uh, Electronic Music Festival uh, which is a yearly festival in San Francisco. And um, here I'm playing with uh, one of my instruments, which is a Buchla synthesizer. And I'm playing uh, with Don Buchla, which is the gentleman who designed these machines in the 60s. It actually is that distorted. It's not. It's just. Oh. It sounds like that. Actually, yeah. It was distorted. I love distortion. No, it's <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's awesome. Yeah, for uh, any of you game designers uh, out there, hit up Alessandro for your next soundtrack. Um, okay, so Greg Pak is a filmmaker and comic book writer, best known for directing the award-winning feature film Robot Stories. He is writing the epic um, and writing the epic Planet Hulk and World War Hulk comic book storylines. Uh, Greg has promised us he will not get angry during this. Uh, view. You're probably sick of those jokes, I'm sure. Uh, and uh, co-writing with Fred uh, Van Lente, the fan favorite Incredible Hercules uh, series for Marvel Comics. Current projects include the acclaimed sci-fi graphic novel and iPad app, which we're about to see, Vision Machine, as well as Extreme X-Men, Doctor Strange Season 1, and Dead Man's Run. Bach was named one of the 25 filmmakers to watch by Filmmaker Magazine, described as a talent with a future by the New York Times, and named Breakout Talent of the Year by Wizard Magazine. So, um, Greg, you want to talk a little bit about what we're going to show us? Yeah, you bet. Um, 
So uh, Vision Machine is this comic book here, um, and there's actually uh, some copies down here, so f feel free to come grab and steal. What's that? Um, uh, and um, the uh, Vision Machine was a, uh, it was funded by the Ford Foundation originally as a way to help independent media makers think about the technological, social, political changes that are going to ha that are happening right now. Um, and uh, uh, which is kind of appropriate given the fact that we're talking about independent media right now. Um, uh, and uh, we did it in, in the context of a big crazy sci-fi thriller, basically. Uh, it's a world in which Sprout Computers, um, uh, no relation to any entity existing, uh, of course, uh, has uh, released its latest bit of fantastic technology called the II, which is a pair of glasses that allow you to instantly record, add special effects to, edit, and share with the world anything that you see. Basically, your dreams become real. Um, and uh, we, the, the, the comic book, we started releasing it in 2010, and then now we're hearing about Google Glass, so it's basically, that's another way to think about it. It's about looking at the, uh, what Google, Google Glass and these, this kind of technology is gonna do for us um, as right, uh, just everybody on the planet, but particularly uh, anybody who has any interest in media making. So ITVS uh, funded th uh, the iPad app version of this, which um, we are debuting this month uh, at the New York Comic Con. Um, and the iPad app uh, has, um, here I'll just go ahead and play a little bit of it for you here. It is an interactive comic book. Um, it takes the art from the comic uh, and it marries it with a full soundtrack with both music and audio. Uh, you swipe through panel by panel, um, and I'll Behold, stop talking. We'll play a little bit a of it. The visionary, the super modern costumed adventurer with the ability to see anything and everything. Wait, on the other side of the city, crime is being committed. Look, this just because you say it. I don't just say, Detective Carmichael. I know. This IRL button is in real life, and there's uh, you tap on that, and you get some. Nifty stuff, in this case, the concept art. Uh, and I'll just go for a few more panels. And here. instantly impart that knowledge to anyone he meets. And now, so do you. So as the story goes on, we meet these uh, three young media makers uh, who, these here are our young heroes, and each one of them gets their hands on this piece of crazy technology uh, known as the I.I., and uh, crazy things ensue. Um, it's a world of fantastic possibility because just as in the world we live in right now, um, when you have this technology, suddenly it's possible to create stuff that you never would have been able to create for as little money uh, as, uh, as, as in the past. Um, my own life as an independent media maker was transformed when, when Apple came out with Final Cut Pro when I was in film school. Uh, because and, and also when Sony came out with the VX1000 back in the day, which was the first kind of prosumer mini DV camcorder that really let you do stuff. Anyway, so um, uh, but uh, so fantastic opportunities. Our young filmmakers are bedazzled and uh, and they do amazing things with it. And then the other shoe drops uh, because there's a whole host of copyright trademark issues and then um, and then also surveillance and privacy issues that this kind of technology inspires. Um, and uh, and you can read the whole story. It, it was since it was funded by grants. It's distributed on a Creative Commons license, uh, and if you go to visionmachine.net, you can download the book and remix it, do whatever you want with it. Um, eventually, we'll, we'll probably release the sound files as well from the app and, and do that the same way. And I'll just show off one other cool thing. There's this um, sort of 3D uh, thingamajig here where you can play with some of these scenes in 3D, because they, and which kind of gives you a, you know, a, a little inside look to how this app was built it was animated in Maya and then built in Unity, and this just shows the different layers that went into it. So, uh, so yeah, that's what I'm working on right now. So, um, I want to move on to, to Kelly Santiago, who I think many of you are familiar with. She's a familiar face here at Indiecade. Uh, Kelly is the president and co-founder of That Game Company, and over the last six years, Kelly has developed one of the most prominent brands in independent and innovative game development pushing the, communi the cu communicative possibilities of video games as a medium. She is currently a partner in Indie Fund, which aims to support the growth of games as a medium by helping indie developers get and stay financially independent. Rad. And I'm gonna show, uh, if you haven't seen it, this game is here at the festival, but we're gonna show a little bit of the trailer from, from, from Journey. 
So in Journey, you play as this rogue figure on a journey to a mountaintop, um, very much inspired by Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. And along the way, you can encounter another rogue figure like yourself, and that's another player online. But you can see, just like in this video, that's how it looks in game. It's uh, totally anonymous. Um, you basically just choose that if you want to journey together or not. And if you don't want to, you can walk away from each other and you'll be disconnected and left open to connect to another person, always a one-on-one -on -one connection. Um, so the goal was to create an online console game that actually made you feel better about humanity instead of worse. Great, who here has played Journey? Oh. Awesome. Um, good, so we're gonna move on to Renee. Uh, Renee Tajima Pena is a documentary filmmaker whose credits include the Academy Award nominated Who Killed Vincent Chin, Calavera Highway, my America, or Honk If You Love Buddha. In her current film, No Mas Hijos Por Vida, uh, No More Babies for Life, her films have premiered at film festivals and venues around the world, including uh, Cannes, New Directors, New Films, Sundance, Toronto, and the Whitney Biennial. Um, she was awarded an Albert Award in the Arts USA Broad Fellowship and a Guggenheim Fellowship. She was founding faculty of the Social Documentation Program at UC Santa Cruz, where she is a professor of film and digital media. She's also a visiting professor of Asian American Studies at UCLA. So not, not a whole lot there. <laughs> um, Unfortunately, I wasn't nominated for all those films for an Academy Award. Um, so do you want to set up the clip that you brought? Yeah, I will. So. Um, I'm a documentary storyteller and content creator, which I think is a complete tectonic shift from where, when I started where we would just create a documentary story, 90 minutes, it's projected and it disappears and that's it. Now we're really, I think, documentary uh, content creators in search of pl different platforms um, to show our work on and to collaborate with. So this film, uh, trailer is my newest work in progress, uh, No More Babies for Life, about Mexican-American women who were coercively sterilized at LA County Hospital um, downtown in the 1970s. It was edited by Kate Trumbull, who's here. So um, this is it. Even when he was taking me to the operating room, I said, I do not want to be sterilized. I want to have another baby. My older sister, I told her, I'm going to tell you something real serious. And then I told her, ma'am, they sterilized her. She can't have no more kids. She can't, you know? Tubal ligation can be accomplished either vaginally or abdominally. It has no effect on menstruation or ovulation. Estaban diciendo que uno, todas las mexicanas, teníamos un montón de, de niños y que después andábamos con problemas ahí que no hallamos ni cómo mantener los hijos. This baby boy became a citizen one minute ago. His mother does not have immigration papers. We're told they should be sterilized to save taxpayers welfare Something money. drastic must be done about population growth. So, um, I think you can see just from whether it's you know, artistic experimentation or untold stories that need to be told, uh, why in their own way everyone here is doing really important work. So um, that was great. Thank you for sharing, sharing that. Um, so I want to jump right into the conversation. And like I said, feel free. Um, this is kind of a prompt where I, I thought that it would be interesting to hear from some, from some folks their response to, to this statement, which is, um, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And I want you to think about, like, right now, as you're in your moment as an independent artist, how you would respond to that. And uh, why don't we start with you, Alessandra? Well, um, to be brief, um, the best part has always been the fact that I can, you know, nowadays I can um, write something, whether it's a song or a record, or and have it out in the wild in a day, really. I mean, I'm using this infrastructure called Topspin, which is a software infrastructure that allows me to release music, uh, merchandise, and, and so on through widgets. They're very easy to integrate on a website. And it's up to me to decide what, what music goes in there, how much I charge, if it's for free, if it's an E4M, so it's, if it's uh, email for media, so I just collect email in exchange for 
for an MP3 or whatnot. Um, and basically, the currency tends to be email in the end, you know, because roughly 10 to 20 percent of the email base is who's going to buy your music, as long as you provide a specific mar um, shop. If I w if I'd have to think about the drawback is doing everything on your own, probably personally, um, writing music and being let's use the word artist, uh, can become a little stressful if you do it on your own because the creative part, it's not just music anymore. It's, you know, uh, you create a record and then most likely you're going to make it sound the way that you want on your own and then you'll have to think about the way you're going to package it, the way you're going to sell it, uh, the way you're going to tour it, if you're going to tour it because there's still money in the touring for musicians. Um, which leads you, whether you like it or not, if you're alone doing it, without energies by the, by the end of a cycle. It's very difficult to feel energized and start over again, you know. So the advantage is probably the good things are the fact that you can do everything on your own and you have total control. I have total control on what comes out and when it comes out and who gets it. Uh, the drawback is that um, I do it all by myself. So sometimes you do feel, you know, uh, the need of having a t teammates, whether it's management, whether it's a label, you know. Unfortunately, all these ideas tend to be, to my experience, very romanticized in the sense that everyone that I know that it's on a label is not as happy as I am in the end. You know, there are pros and cons to every situation. But I think ideally, um, it'd be great to have the liberty to do things on your own, but also sharing that vision with a team which is ultimately what, what's happening right now, uh, personally, where I'm s starting to build a team out of necessity as opposed to out of, oh, maybe I should have this person helping me or I should hire a PR you know, firm or get a management or an agent. How, I want to get, uh, for any of you, how does uh, what Alessandro just said sort of resonate with you and your work? And I'm just curious about that idea of like so self-distribution and the team. Have the amazing <laughs> into my answer. Like, it's really crazy. <laughs> yeah. Greg, what about you for comic books? I mean, I think that's a that's an interesting thing that I don't know very much about. Um, right. Um, the uh, so I started off in film, and I have been working primarily in comics over the last six, seven years. Uh, and um, it was kind of a strange experience because I came up through independent film. You know, going to all the indie, you know, indie film festivals and doing independent shorts, and finally getting a you know very low budget feature off the ground. Um, and that's how I came up in comics. I started off working for Marvel, which is sort of like you know. You know, working for MGM, or you know, like like starting at uh, with the biggest studio in in comics, and um, uh, creatively, it wasn't at all a strange transition because people in I mean, I think comics is a small enough industry that that uh, that people just really you know it, it's a small group that's working together. It's a lot like independent film in that kind of sense, and also everybody just cared about the work and cared about the stories, and it, it just made total sense. Um, uh, but there is a way in which um, you know, when you are doing work for hire uh, for a company, that's different from doing your own stuff, you know. On, on one hand, it's different in the sense that you don't own it, you know, and it's up to other people, I mean, uh, to, you know, other people own it and other people are, and it's, it's part of a product, it's part of a big line of other products, you know. On the other hand, it's the same because if you don't care about it the same way you care about your own stuff, it's going to be bad and you won't work much longer. So, uh, I mean, it is a kind of a funny thing where you have to still... You know, working for hire, I, I have to care as much about the Hulk as I care about, you know, anything I've ever done in order to make those Hulk comics work. Same thing for the, you know, the Extreme X-Men book I'm doing right now. I love Dazzler. Dazzler is the star of the Extreme X-Men book I'm working on, and, and I love her like my own. Um, uh, but, um, but there is the reality that in the comics field right now, more and more people, I think, are um, seeing the importance of... Uh, of uh, you know, even people who are doing very well in company-owned books are seeing the importance of doing independent work. Um, because, uh, you know, in the long term, if you have done something independently that you actually own, you have uh, a, a chance of reaping more benefit from it in the, in the very long term. You know, I mean, there are obvious huge examples of that with Robert Kirkman in The Walking Dead and, uh, uh, and Brian O'Malley with uh, Scott Pilgrim. Um, you know, these are folks who hustled for years with, uh, with small projects and built up huge audiences for them and then, uh, you know, and, and, and saw those things go on and have big success in other media. Um, so those are 
you know, so, so those are some of the things that are, you know, in, in the comics world, that's, that, that's, that's a lot of what's going on. I mean, when you talk about the, the best of times, the worst of times, I think it's like, I, everything that, that Alessandro said resonates with me too, you know what I mean? In the sense that even if you're working for a corporate-owned entity doing company work, you're still promoting it, you know what I mean? Um, and if you do no promotion versus doing a lot of promotion, that can be the difference between a book uh, getting canceled or not. Um, and so, you know, being, developing that, developing a way to build an audience and get word out to that audience and, and you know, uh, I mean, that's the, that, that becomes part of the job. Um, I mean, I enjoy that, so it doesn't drive me crazy, uh, uh, but at the same time, there is that kind of tension. It's like, um, it, that, that the time you're doing that is not time you're spending writing new stories. At the same time, you know, we write stories because we want to get them out to people, and part of promoting it is, uh, it, I mean, promotion is also about hearing back from other people, particularly when it comes to social media. You know, it's social media for, I think for social media promotion to work, it has to be a back and forth thing, uh, more than just a sort of delivering stuff to people. Um, and, uh, and then that's also part of learning as an artist, you know, ideally. Good, so I want to come back to some of the, some of the audience development stuff, but I wanted to ask Renee a specific question, actually, and, and Kelly as well. Um, and this goes back to Alessandro's point about working alone versus having a team. With film, it seems like it's, you need to work with a team. And I was just curious about how you actually are able to network and sort of build teams of people to support your work. Um, I mean, there are filmmakers who work by themselves, and now because of new technology, you can do that. I've always worked in collaboration. That's part of the reason I'm a filmmaker. I just like, you know, I like feeding off of the ideas of other people. And, I, and with my collaborators, almost everybody I work with, if they're sound, if they're camera, if they're editors, they're also directors, which I think is they're never just that crew person, but they're also a director or an artist in their own right so that they can contribute to, for example, I'll tell a composer, I don't want you just to score something, you know, that kind of heightens the drama of my film or whatever. I want your own kind of original take on, I want a piece of music you would compose for, you know, for yourself as well as for a film because often a, a film score is just very functional for the film or very formulaic for a film. Um, and in terms of collaboration, it's, you know, I tell you part of it is when I had a young kid, I was only working with women with young kids because we all had the same schedule and they knew not to call me at, you know, a certain time. And they knew, like, if I had to rush out, I was gone and I knew the same with them. So some, some decisions you make are just very, very um, strategic decisions. Um, but otherwise, it's, you know, it's, I, I, I teach, I have students. I mean, Kate, who cut this piece, uh, was one of my students. Um, I get a lot of USC students through my, my colleagues. And, um, and I came up through the independent But you film pay making. them. I pay, I never <laughs> have free interns. We talked interns. about this before, no free interns. Yeah, I, you know, because I make social change films and I'm really concerned that I've seen so many talented people who come from poor and working class families who just don't have a career. Because not only do they get out in their 20s, they've got to maybe pay off school loans, make a living. A lot of times people have to send money back to their families. You know, if they're immigrants, they send money back to, I know somebody sends money back to El Salvador, to her father, and it's, uh, it's really hard. So if I'm expecting them to pay for their gas, pay for their lunch, and not make any money while they're working with me, you know, I think that it, 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 it becomes like the Romney vision of, you want to start a small business, you know, borrow money from your parents. I mean, you know, a lot of people just can't do that. They can't be subsidized. So I always think about that. Good, so uh, Kelly, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, that team question too, which is, you know, uh, the, you know, the independent gaming community is fairly new. How do you go out and sort of find collaborators and people that are willing to, you know, kind of support your work? Um, yeah, you come to festivals like these is really the, the best way. And there are a lot of, um, on, I think, online resources and communities. Um, but it can be hard to, you know, sift through, I think, especially if you're, um, an alternative independent game developer, whether it be alternative subject matters you're interested in or you're sort of a uh, part of a minority within our industry, uh, it can be trickier to sort of sift through the louder majority voices and, and connect and find with one, uh, one another, which is, I think, why IndieCade especially is so fantastic. Um, 
w I think it's really interesting that the time we're in right now, I feel like we're at a place where a lot of um, people who sort of started real independent development at sort of the rise of the digital distribution platforms in 2006 and 2007 now have uh, like a couple games under their belts and experience and um, and are able to more definitely move from project to project and sort of have these different collaborations. It's sort of like they're more people with skill sets to facilitate uh, collaborations based on projects rather than um, the, I think what's been in the past sort of the, the traditional route of um, building a company. You know, you can go from project to project, uh, which is really exciting because I think there are uh, certainly restrictions that you have to work within when you are looking to build a company versus just build a, a single game. And really, you can make choices to really lean into each other, one another's um, interest at that time, you know, and uh, explore uh, a space that may be very topical. Um, and that's okay because, you know, it's just this game. Okay, what I want to do now is just do uh, just a quick, you know, just quick go around, and I want you to, um, I want to know, by percentage, how would you say you divide your time between qu creative work and business? Um, just think about is it is it 50-50, or how do you split your time? Um, Alessandro? It's really a blur. I don't, I mean, it's, it's, it's very <laughs> difficult to divide the two. Um, and actually it's a conversation that I was having with my friend Michael earlier, it's very hard to put value on something that comes out of your heart, you know, when it's art, and I'm sure it's the same for designers when, and I'm assuming it's easier and it's more that way when you start out, because it was that way for music for me. Um, how it happened for me after I left Nine Inch Nails was that I started writing music on a specific instrument, which was this synthesizer you saw in the video, and. Uh, instead of fart noises, songs came out. So I actually ended up you know, writing records, two records of songs, and it was a, a blast to do, and, and we're, it was a full year, one of the best years of my life, just because I felt so creative, and uh, everything felt new, and the instrument was a playground, really. Um, and it's very difficult to feel that way when you play only one instrument all your life, which was guitar for me to begin with. Um, so, I wanted the world to listen to this. So it was fairly easy, mentally speaking, to sit down and just make the point of the situation and go, okay, how do I you know, release this and maybe make a living from it? And so there was a drive that you know, tends to go away after you come to terms and realize that, oh wait, that was my job for two years and I actually paid my bills and made a living from it. Oh wait, that means that I need to do another one. <laughs> And at that moment is when the gates of creativity, is, the creativity close, and you just don't have anything else to say. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, personally, so it's very difficult to tell you where business, I mean, to me, the business part of the last two years of releasing my music were just as creative as the music side. I wanted to come up with a smart, clever, interesting way to release my music that would be interesting to me, to people like-minded, and to people that didn't know me, you know, the people that would go on Engadget who covered the synthesizer that we released and go, ah, oh, that's a great idea, let's see how the music is. And even if they don't end up buying it, they might download the music for free or pass the information along to somebody else who will come to a show and buy two t-shirts. So that was just as creative as making music for me. Um, so I wouldn't know, I mean, to me, when it works, it's, you know, everything is the same. Great point. I'm glad you bring that up because I talk to filmmakers all the time, and they say, "Oh God, so I have to do all this social media stuff. It's taking up all of my time, and I don't have time to be creative, and it puts me in a whole different space." Um, so I think your point about how do you make the business side of your work as creative as possible is really important. I don't, Kelly, you. Yeah. Um. The the way I feel very s similarly in that I think I thrive best when it feels like it's all a, a organic process that's coming out of the initial creative impetus to begin with. So when that, for me, it's the, when the, the emphasis is on sort of what am I putting out there into the world? Okay, th this is who I think would like it. These are where the people are and you know, I'm, I'm genuinely excited and motivated about it so I'm talking about it. Um, 
and that all of the decisions around um, distribution and price point and stuff are sort of motivated by that as opposed to I think um, you know there's certainly people in our industry that are really great at knowing how to uh, create value by hiring X amount of people at this time to sell the company at this moment and that kind of stuff is not um, it's not exciting to me, so and that's definitely a very, very different mind space. Um, so, so in my process, it's it's much more interwoven, and I feel more at home when when I am uh, when I feel like it's being very genuinely driven by by the the work itself. So yeah, you know, I follow Greg on Twitter, and if uh, you you all should follow Greg on Twitter, and he's a prolific tweeter, <laughs> I gotta say. So I'm curious to know how you split your time, because I feel like. You live on the East Coast, and I'll get tweets from you at like one in the morning West Coast time, and I'm like, yeah. what the hell is Greg doing? Yeah, I, I, uh, I spend a lot of nights writing. You know, I mean, I, 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 um, I, have my, I constantly have deadlines. In comics, you basically always are have something due. I have something due right now. I don't know why I'm here, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, and and so I, I work at all crazy hours. Um, uh, you know, when you're balancing a family with with work, also, you know, you end up just doing what you can do when you can do it. Um, and Twitter is, I mean, Twitter becomes like, you know, like when I take a breather, you know, uh, I mean, Twitter is also a weird sort of thing for the comics industry in that it's sort of like the industry water cooler. Everybody in comics is on Twitter, and and people are just like joking around on there all the time. Um, uh, and it's it's it is this kind of strange thing where on the one hand, it's a big waste of time, uh, frankly. Uh, on the other hand, it is how you continue to cement your relationships with different people. I mean, there, there's, some, there's some folks I work with who I joke with on Twitter or talk with on Twitter, and that actually has deepened our understanding of each other. You know, uh, you know uh, and, and I, I think lays the groundwork for actual creative collaboration, you know. Um, there's also a way in which as you develop a voice, you know, sort of that public voice, you're, you're interacting with people who actually read your books. And, um, and I think if people know you, uh, you know, it, it's like going to cons as well. It's like, you know, you, you go to a convention, you meet people face to face, um, they're more likely to buy your stuff. It's the same thing with if you're a filmmaker and if you go to a festival and if people see your face, you're more likely to get an audience award than if you don't go. You know what I mean? It, it's it's just it, it, it it's just reality that that if you go places, if you show up, and if you are happy to be there and happy to share about this process, and and uh, people respond because we're human beings. You know what I mean? We're we're social creatures, um, and so Twitter becomes uh, you know a way of of doing that. Um, I mean it's it, it it's also. Um, it's nice because I, as a filmmaker, I was used to going to film festivals and seeing audience reaction. And when you're writing comics, they come out all the time, but it's not like you're hanging out at the comic shop waiting to you know, see what people thought of it, you know what I mean? Um, so, so the internet becomes a place where you start, you know, where you, you get some feedback from people, which, which is, well, you know, at the, you know, the, there's, there's, there's plus and minuses to that. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, but, but you're learning from that all the time. I mean, with my, with Robot Stories, I literally saw that thing. I watched that movie um, probably 30 times in, in festival screenings uh, because I wanted to see how the audience reacted. And I learned every time I watched it, and it became a different movie every time I watched it. I actually, the, the first time I ever really noticed that was with a short film I had called Mouse, which was the first short I ever had that played in a lot of festivals. And, you know, I'd, I'd noticed that if it was a very sparsely populated, you know, if, if it was too cold, if it was, if there weren't that many people in the audience, you know, you get different reactions based on all kinds of weird things. And that's educational, you know what I mean? That, that, that helps you learn about you know, how you're putting stuff together. You know, even down to like, in a, in a film festival, probably half the time they're gonna screw up the first 10 seconds of your movie in the projection. They're gonna forget to turn on the sound, or it's gonna be out of focus or something. So if you have something really critical in that first 10 to 15 seconds, there's an excellent chance it'll be lost. <laughs> so, you know, like I learned, okay, always put like a bug up there, you know, put a, put a logo up there for a little while before the thing starts, you know what I mean? But those are those kinds of things you learn by seeing how they, how people react, and, and I think social media provides some of that. Um, so, uh, Renee, you, you also teach, mm -hmm. and so I just maybe speak a little bit about sort of that, you know, work, and you're, you have a family, and it's like the, the work-life balance, and is teaching for you, um, 
do you do it because you have to, or because you enjoy it, or? Um, you know, I went about 20 years making films without teaching, so it's, um, well, it's, it's something now I really enjoy. Um, I would say as a documentary, well, documentary filmmaking is really, it's a series of problems you have to find a creative solution to, whether it's a business problem, like you can't shoot a scene, or if it's a, um, you know, life problem where you need the money, or if it's like a aesthetic problem where, you know, you need to express the interior life of a character and it's not visible to anybody but that character, so how do you do that? So, um, in terms, so I look at, I look at things in a, like a blur and in a very kind of integrated way where my teaching, my filmmaking, my life, the business aspect, everything is kind of integrated. I think I had to um, multitask that way. So I find it, all those different aspects very energizing. I can't say I find the business side as energizing as, as anything else, but you know, over the years I've just come to accept that you, you just, you have to do it. But, um, but, but there are a lot of business problems in financing and you know, distribution that has everything to do with creatively how you make a film. You know, like getting released forms from people um, you know, can, does that get you access or not? You know, licensing um, found footage or found audio, can you use it or not? If you can't use it, then how are you gonna solve that, that problem? So it's, it's, everything is integrated. There's no separation between all these different aspects of being a filmmaker. Well, and also, like you were saying, how you do business affects the ethos. You know, I mean, it, 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 re it, it can reflect the ethos of the storytelling you're doing, like, like you know, like the fact that you pay people <laughs> because you work in social justice, you know, media. I mean, that that makes sense, you know. I mean, that, so those business choices. I mean, it's like the Creative Commons thing, also that Alessandro was talking about. You know what I mean? Like, those are business decisions, but they're also creative decisions. Although Creative Commons, the problem with that is, I mean, artists are w cultural workers. So if you're getting free stuff from other artists, how are, are artists making a living? How are they monetizing their own work? I mean, so there's problems, I think, on both sides. So, um, you know, I want to, I think we don't have a whole lot of time, so I want to open it up to the audience here in a second. Does anyone have any, any questions for this group? And you know what, if you ask a question, you're gonna get one of Greg's comics. <laughs> you might get one anyway, but, um, so uh, yeah, right, right up here. I'm sorry, it was how do we get feedback from the audience? Yeah. Oh, you spoke to the audience. Um, so we get it, well, during the process of development, we, we do it through playtesting. Uh, every two weeks we have people come in, uh, play the game. I'm saying we, at that game company we did this, I would do it anyways, I guess I should say. Um, and uh, from the end user, it was harder on PlayStation Network because we don't have, as developers there, you don't have direct access through the network to your users. Of course, on, um, I think PC is probably like the, the most access you can have directly because you can sort of establish how much information, I mean, you can track everything that your, your player's doing and, and get a sense of, depending on the game, um, what things you want to look at. You know, how long is, are they taking to get through a level? What, but color button are they clicking on, that kind of stuff. Um, so there are a, a lot of different options and otherwise we just get uh, feedback by you know setting up a forum, the email, making sure that they know how to contact us and trying to put that in the game as we can like at the, at the end of the credits and journey and I think if you were to have like a website or anything, making it very easy to find you and, and connect with you. audience, I guess, fan for, uh, for <laughs> So I'm curious, we actually talked a little bit about that at lunch, is sort of bringing, you know, bringing the audience into the development process, obviously through, with, with games and software, that's a part of, you know, testing and, and the development process, it's kind of organic to it. But I'm curious in your work, if you, you know, where you bring the audience in and um, how you get feedback, so. Well, to me, the audience always comes in, at, you know, it's music, so, I mean, I, I don't think any like, fan or person that likes my music would like to write the music with me. I mean, they, they kind of want to hear what I do, and then 
either they like it or don't, you know, it's very easy. But um, so I think music's a little different when it comes to, to that. Um, even though, I mean, I'm not saying that you couldn't be collaborating with, with you know, somebody that also is a fan. Uh, it's just, I think it's a little bit, uh, as, a, as a final medium and, a, and an art form, I think it lends itself less to crowd collaboration, let's call it that, you know, like end user, you know, influence to the final product. But I mean, maybe more from an art point of view, like the artwork of records I've seen being submitted by fans, you know, or ideas for videos or whatnot. So something that is linked when to I the main core. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the differences is, is that I'm just curious if you would agree with it, because I because I think about it in other mediums and film and music, especially um, that you like with film, you may have um, the what is it focus testing at the end, but. Um, but I would think that as you're creating, you're sort of creating the album that sounds good to you. And like you said, you put it out and either someone's gonna like it or someone doesn't. Where I think games have this element of, um, even if a game's not fun, there's sort of the engagement factor that you wanna be seeing. Are you getting the reaction that you intended to through this moment in the game or through the experience itself? And sort of, you know, if you make a game but no one plays it, are you really a game designer? Like, I, I think, think it's really are. at a core question of, uh, of our medium. <laughs> I'm just thinking about Maniac Mansion and how I still play that game and I go back to it and I'm like, man, I can't believe I spent so many hours playing that game. <laughs> the yeah, interface right. sucks. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, the, uh, uh, in terms of gauging audience reaction, the, the, <laughs> the, the harshest way and most practical way in comics is whether or not enough people buy it so that the book can continue to go on. Um, uh, you know, money is the determining factor in mainstream comics. You know, how many units does it sell and does the book continue? Um, there are um, other, I mean, comics is a strange and special creature in that from the beginning there has been a remarkable amount of, uh, of uh, feedback between creators and um, and, uh, and readers, um, more so than a lot of other fields. Uh, you know, it, it, there's this whole culture of comic book conventions where creators go and they sign books for hours and, and, and are constantly, you know, and people have access to comics creators in a way they don't necessarily have access to, say, film directors in the same kind of way. Um, so comics creators are used to getting a lot of feedback, <laughs> not all of it pleasant, uh, uh, particularly if you're working in mainstream comics and you happen to have a character do something that folks don't necessarily like. Um, uh, and that's, uh, so, so that's kind of part of that culture. Um, the other thing that I wanted to throw out there is that um, with, uh, with the Vision Machine app, um, I wanted to try to find a way to use the technology that's coming up to um, provide a, a place for, um, for more direct interaction. Uh, and as part of the app, there's a Twitter button. And if you tap that Twitter button, it, it, it puts up a stream of any tweets that use the Vision Machine hashtag. So as you're reading the book, you, the stream is drifting along. And for example, when we get this thing underway, when it's actually released out in the wild, um, uh, we, we can announce, OK, you know, 7 PM Central, we're going to do, or 10 PM Central, actually, so that people on the West Coast can do, or do whatever. Well, we're going we're gonna to do a live um, reading and uh, Q&A. And, and just use the Vision Machine hashtag and you can follow this conversation along live within the book. You know, and, and that, that can kind of provide, I mean, the technology is, is for digital comics, there's a million things that haven't yet been done because they're expensive to try to do and it hasn't been proven yet, but we're, we're taking a stab at playing with some of this. Um, and I think there's a lot of rich opportunity for that kind of feedback. I think in filmmaking, the, the most difficult thing is um, because feedback is very subjective, how do you sort of maintain a vision when you're getting a lot of different kinds, especially when you're in the process of making a film? So I have a rule of thumb, if three people have the same criticism, they're probably right. On the other hand, maybe people just aren't seeing what you can see, and you just need time to you know, complete that vision. So that's a risk. So people are saying, well, it sucks, and you say, well, they're probably right, or, well, maybe not. Maybe they're just not seeing it yet, and I'm going to really push ahead. And pushing ahead may mean a lot of time, a lot of money, and it may mean, yeah, it sucks in the end. So there's always that, that risk factor. Um, 
but you know that's what makes it very interesting. Yeah. Well, also anything anything that is successful was hated. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, and, and any, anything that is great can sound incredibly stupid. <laughs> um, you know, like like people. You know, I mean that's. And, and lots of times the stuff we're working on is incredibly stupid and it's going to be bad. Um, you know, all of us have tons of bad, bad, bad work that we have to get out of our system. I'm still doing a lot of bad work, let's, let's be honest. You know what I mean? It's like we, we constantly make mistakes and that's part of the process is getting through all that. But at the same time, there's the way in which um, you, have to, you have to filter, uh, it's, it's like you're saying, you have to be able to filter out the stuff from people who just don't get it. You know, and you have to you have to have the arrogance to believe that whatever you are doing is worth doing. Um, otherwise, you're not going to do it, and no one will ever see it. Can we have? Uh, I know we're running out of time. Do you think we can push like a few more minutes to get some more questions? Okay, another. How about up here? Uh, to me, is not make music. Do completely something completely different. Take a vacation, a forced vacation where you don't have an instrument with you. You don't think about it. Go see people. Go watch movies. Or if I have to do music because I feel like otherwise I'm a loser, then do something that doesn't have to do with songs, which is what I've been doing now. I've been composing, scoring documentaries, and releasing instrumental records. And eventually, I can feel it. It's coming back slowly. You know, the the need to to write songs. But I would say getting away from your comfort zone. You know, for a, a certain period of time. The, the last couple weeks, I actually went through a period, and I found it um, at the a suggestion of someone else um, really helpful to actually completely scale down my sense of obligation and need to work on this thing to one hour in the week. And so instead of just totally stopping and like continuing to stop because I keep thinking about how massive the thing is I'm going to do and all the things I have to do on it and thinking, okay, next week, next week I'm going to like really cram on this. Um, just taking one hour and saying, okay, I'm just going to dedicate this hour to doing stuff on this project and, you know, cut off email, cut off the distractions and just that hour. And that sort of like helps, I don't know, take the plug out a little bit of the dam. Uh, I got two things. One is um, having a deadline that you have to make in order to get paid is a great is a great thing. Um, working in comics has been great for me because uh, it forced me to write all the time. And um, sometimes uh, the best thing to do is just is to stop second guessing and just to frickin' write it. Get that first draft out. Know it's going to be terrible or know it's going to be problematic, but then you can fix it. You know, uh, rewriting is so much easier than writing, uh, and uh, so as soon as the quicker I can get to the rewriting stage, the better. Um, and sometimes I throw away tons of stuff, but you know, I haven't stopped. You know, um, the other thing is uh, uh, there's this concept called active learning, which is this whole you know pedagogical concept. But one of the things they talk about is the fact that most people need to can only focus on one thing for like 20 minutes at a time, and literally just standing up and stretching. <laughs> every 20 minutes. Um, I, I, for a while, I was listening to a lot of uh, music on LPs while I was working, which was really good because you have to get up every 15 to 20 minutes oh. to flip it. You know what I mean? And, and that actually rejuvenates. I, I tend to find that, uh, I mean, it's ridiculous how often this happens, but um, I will take a shower, and while I'm taking a shower, I'll figure out whatever it was that I needed to figure out. So, you know, finding those little break things that, that help you you know, help clear your head. I think the shower is like, I think it's totally subliminal and it's symbolic. It's about like cleansing, you know what I mean? And, 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 and it's working on multiple levels there. Renee, do you want to? I think, I mean, everybody thinks I'm spacey when I say this, but really trust your subconscious, which is probably the extension of the shower. <laughs> I, I can't imagine how many times I just wake up in the middle of the night and I have it, but it's really sort of giving in, as they said, do something else, but really trust like something's going on in the deep recess and abyss of your brain, and um, it just will happen magically. <laughs> I don't know how, but uh, it happens. Yeah, so we're gonna, we need to wrap it up, and I, um, I want to, um, first of all, thank all the panelists. They're yeah. so, this is great. I really wish we had more time for this conversation. 
please, you know, feel free to follow up with them individually afterwards. And, and you know, the last statement that I want to say um, is just that independent work is so critical for us, uh, you know, and I think there's there's nothing less at stake than our, you know, to me personally than our, our democracy. That's how important I think it is. You know, we live in this moment with such a glut of media out there that, you know, the loudest and most obnoxious media tends to rule. And, you know, that combined with corporate interests, we end up with, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, the very fastest uh, race to the bottom. And I think that there's, so, I mean, we talked a lot about sort of about the spirit of independent media, but I also feel like it's, it's important for, for, the, for, for the collective good and for society. And so I hope we, we could think about um, also the bigger picture when we do this work. Thanks. Here, here.